Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Experience is taking place as we progress through the steps. We don't have to wait till we get to step 12 to get something out of this thing. Every action step, there is a definite, definite positive reaction to it, a result of it. Page 76. If we can answer to our satisfaction, we then look at step six. We have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready to let God remove from us all the things which we have admitted are objectionable? Can he now take them all, every one? If we still cling to something we will not let go, we ask God to help us be willing. And that's all of step six. And if you'll notice in that paragraph on step six, he didn't say a thing about defects of character. He did say those things which we have admitted are objectionable. Now, surely, 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 as we took our inventory and we took step five and we looked over into that fifth column, and we could see that old selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, inconsiderate character that we had become through living a life run on self-will, when we could see that those are the things that caused us to do the things to set the ball rolling and hurt other people. But we could see that those are the things that ultimately led to our resentments and our fears and our guilt and our remorse. Then surely those things have become objectionable to us by now. Are we ready to turn them loose? If we are, we've already completed step six. And the book recognizes in every action step that self cannot overcome self. We're going to have to have God's help in all of these steps. It says we are not willing. We ask God to help us be willing, recognizing that even though we see those things and see what they do to us, that they have become such a part of our nature for so long that we may not really be willing to turn them loose. Sometimes I think fear keeps us right there not being willing to turn them loose because if we're going to turn loose of those character defects then what's going to take their place what kind of life are we going to live what kind of person are we going to be if we have to turn loose of those character defects if I've got to get around my selfishness then who's going to see I get what I want if I'm going to have to get rid of my dishonesty then how am I going to make a living If I'm going to have to get rid of my fear, then I don't have any excuses anymore for not doing something or just as important for not quitting doing something I need to quit. If I'm going to have to start considering other people and their needs and their wants first, then who's going to take care of me? And sometimes, sometimes fear will keep us sitting right in the middle of those character defects. And sometimes we would rather sit in today's pain and suffering because we kind of learned how to take care of that. Sometimes we'd rather sit in a day's pain and suffering than take a chance on changing in the future, because we don't know what change is going to bring. And the book certainly recognizes that when he says, if we're not willing, we ask God to help us be willing. Now, if we're willing to have God remove those defects of character, then we're already through with step six. And now then, we can look at step seven. Step seven says, when ready, we say something like this. My creator, I'm now willing that you should have all of me, good and bad. I pray that you now remove from me every single defect of character. Uh Uh-oh, uh-oh. Step seven said shortcomings. But if you notice here in the narrative, he said defects of character. You see what he's done to us? He just confused the hell out of us. That's what he did. Playing these words back and forth interchangeably, paying no attention to where they fall which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. Grant me strength as I go out from here to do your bidding. Amen.
some more prayer. You know, there's always a paradox in AA, isn't there? Have you noticed that everything in AA is just backwards from what I used to think? It's always backwards. The paradox here is this. You know what a paradox is? Have you ever called your sponsor so you could listen? <laughs> call so we can talk, don't we, right? We're supposed to call and listen a little bit. And the paradox here that the two of the shortest steps on, on two little paragraphs, but they are two of the biggest steps in all of Alcoholics Anonymous. And because the paradox is that they used the doctor's opinion in the first four chapters to do steps one and two. They did three and a half pages to do step three, eight pages to do step four, four pages to do step five, and there's a whole chapter written working with others, step 12. But the two of the biggest steps in all of Alcoholics Anonymous are on two little bitty paragraphs. Because the time I got around to doing this, I could see what I had become as a result of my fifth step. And I did not like what I, I knew what I had become. And I did not like what I saw. And I began to, a little doubt began to come into my mind. I mean, can God really change me from what I have become to something else? I mean, really? The little doubts began to creep in there. Then I had to reaffirm uh, a statement that I had read earlier. God is everything or else he is nothing. God either is or he isn't. And what was my choice to be? Can God change me from what I had become to that what she intends for me to be? I began to think that, yes, he could. And so I began to do steps six and seven. And six and seven is a, the changing steps, if you will, to change from what I had become to that which God intends for me to be. And there are also the tools of acceptance. We had a lot of people going around today talking about acceptance, acceptance. You just accept this, accept that. You know, I can't do that. Acceptance is not an event. It's a process. And the six and seven is the process to change from what I had become and accept what I have become. We've begun to sense the flow of His Spirit into us. To some extent, we've become God conscious. We've begun to develop this vital sixth sense. But we must go further, and that means more action. And Bill is referring here to God consciousness as a vital sixth sense. You know, everything I know on a conscious level, I have learned through five senses of direction. I can see, I can smell, I can taste, I can hear, and I can touch. Here, those are the normal five senses of direction. And everything I know on a conscious level, I've learned through those five senses. And you can take everything that I know, and you can take everything that Joe knows, and you can take everything that all of you guys know, and we can add it all together. And it's just a tiny, tiny, tiny speck of knowledge compared to the knowledge of the universe. Now, if God has all knowledge and all... And I believe He does. My book says so. And if God dwells within me, and I believe he does, my book says so, then that means that I have somewhere within myself all the knowledge and all the power that I can ever possibly need to handle any conceivable situation that might come up in the future, providing I know how to tap into that knowledge and that power that God consciousness. Now, it's long been known how you do this. Now, this is nothing new at all. The human race has known for thousands of years the way you tap into that God consciousness, that sixth sense of direction, is through prayer and meditation. And when I first came to AA, I was completely bankrupt in those areas. I knew nothing about prayer. Oh, I, I knew a couple of prayers. Uh, uh, one prayer that I used to use a lot when, went like this. It said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I die before, I, I'm not into that prayer anymore. That's dealing with death. The other one that I used quite often went like this. God, if you'll get me out of this damn mess, I swear I'll never do this again. 
That was the extent of my prayer life. Meditation, I knew nothing about meditation at all. Oh, I thought maybe it was trying to clear your mind of all thought. I don't know about you, but I know about me. When I get up in the morning, that sucker turns on, and it runs all day long. I've never been able to stop it or clear it of all thought. I had heard about some kinds of meditation where you chant certain words, or you lie down and listen to soft music, or various different ways. Never having tried any of that, I knew nothing at all about meditation, period. So it would seem to me like trying to develop a life of prayer and meditation would be an impossibility for people like me. And thank God Bill Wilson was a real alcoholic because he had the same problems and he knew that we were going to have them too. And thank God Bill Wilson didn't know very much about prayer and meditation. You see, most people that are really knowledgeable in those areas, when they write on prayer and meditation, they write so far over my head, I don't understand what they're saying. But Bill couldn't do that. What Bill did do was give us some definite and valuable suggestions that if we would follow them, we would develop our own life of prayer and meditation. For just a few minutes, let's see what he had to say. You know, prayer and meditation works at all times, but especially works here after step 10 because now we've cleared away a lot of the wreckage of the past. We're more in tune with the spirit of the universe, if you will. You know, communication is the beginning of all understanding. I'll give you an example. Thursday at noon when we started here, a lot of y'all didn't know us very well. And we didn't know you very well. But we've been talking and listening to each other all this weekend. We know better. We know each other better today. Communication. Talking and listening. Now, if that would work for you and I... Wouldn't that work for me and God? If I would talk to God and listen to God, wouldn't he know me better? Wouldn't I know him better? That's communication. Praying and listening. More listening than praying. Page 85, bottom of the page. Step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. We shouldn't be shy on this matter. Better men than we are using it constantly. It works if we have the proper attitude and work at it. It would be easy to be vague about this matter. In other words, Bill's saying, I wish I didn't have to do this. <laughs> Yet we believe we can make some definite and valuable suggestions. Now, he's going to give us a suggestion on what we do when we go to, go to bed at night. He's going to give us a suggestion on what we do when we get up in the morning. He's going to give us a suggestion on what we do when we face indecision. He's going to give us a suggestion on how to pray. And then he's going to give us one on what we do when we're agitated or doubtful. And if we know what to do at night, if we know what to do when we get up in the morning, if we know what to do when we face indecision, if we know what to do when we pray, if we know what to do when we're agitated or doubtful, that pretty well covers the whole day, doesn't it? Let's look at the first one. See, when we retire at night, we constructively, constructively review our day. Were we resentful, selfish, dishonesty, or afraid? Uh-oh, there's step four again. Do we owe an apology? Uh-oh, there's eight and nine again. Have we kept something to ourselves which should be discussed with another person at Uh-oh, once? there's five again. Were we kind and loving toward all? What could we have done better? Where were we were we thinking of ourselves most of the time? Or were we thinking of what we could do for others? Or what we could pack into the stream of life? But we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. And there are six and seven again. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Step 10, he tells us to use step 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, and 9. And here in step 11, he's telling us to do the same thing when we go to bed at night. Use 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Look at these things. Now, we're going to give you a little, one more little sheet, one more little picture before we're through. And we kind of made up a little inventory sheet that we can use at night before we go to bed. 
you could use about anything you want to, really. But uh, this one might be an example of what would be sufficient to use. And on one side of that sheet, we have the uh, personality characteristics of a self-willed human being, which is what we were when we came to AA. And on the other side of the sheet, we have the personality characteristics of a God-willed human being. And all we're trying to do, really, is get from the left-hand side of the sheet to the right-hand side of the sheet. And we can take this little inventory sheet at night, run down through it, making a few check marks, and we can see which side of the sheet we've been on that day. Now, never, never have I found myself entirely, completely on either side of the sheet. Some days it's more on the left, and some days it's more on the right. But I do find, as I do this over and over and over, over a period of time, I'm slowly, slowly, gradually checking more on the right than I am on the left. What this really does, it shows me what I've been that day, shows me what I need to change and what I need to change to. You know, I've been in AA long enough to know and fully realize that I am going to do an inventory. Now, I've got one or two choices. I can wait until I'm so fouled up and so sick that I'm almost drunk and start trying to dig myself out from under that mess, or I can take a little sheet like this and do it on a daily basis, and I'm in much less chance of chain danger of getting drunk if I do, plus I find that it takes less energy to do it on a daily basis than it does to wait until I'm almost drunk. But I'm going to do it one way or the other. I don't have any choice in it. You know, there was a old philosopher that lived called, his name was Carl Sandburg. And Sandburg said, when a society fails, there's always one thing present. That is that they have forgotten where they came from. And if they forget where they came from, they forget where they're going and they get lost out there somewhere. And you and I are the same way. If we don't inventory... We forget where we came from, and we get lost out there too, just like society would. Very definite and valuable suggestion. The most spiritual people I know in the world today tell me the same thing. Daily inventory, daily discussing things with other human beings is a part of their regular schedule. If it's good enough for them, it's probably good enough for me. Now when we get up in the morning... On awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, or self-seeking motives. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance, for after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Most of us, when we get up in the morning, the first thing we do is go to the bathroom. Now, I had a guy tell me the first thing he did was get on his treadmill. And I said, well, you've got a better bladder than I do. I go to the bathroom. After we get through in the bathroom, then we usually go to the kitchen. And we have a little coffee or whatever it is we might use in the morning for a beverage. Maybe we eat a little bit of food. We take care of the body. We feed it. We go back to the bathroom and you ladies start fixing your hair and your face. and We men start shaving and do whatever it is that we do. Working on the body again. After we get through with that, we go to the closet and we start picking out our clothes for the day. Now these clothes have got to be perfect and they've got to match and it takes a lot of time to pick them out. And we pick them out and we clothe the body and we, we take care of the body again. We get ready to leave the house. We feed the dog. We feed the cat or whatever it is we might have. As we go out the door, we make sure we've got the door locked because we don't want anybody stealing our material junk while we're gone that day. <laughs> we go out to the automobile. We walk around it, check the air and the tires. We get in, put the key in the switch, turn it on, look at the fuel in the fuel tank start the car, and we take off. 
And we did all of those things to take care of the body, to take care of the material things, to take care of the automobile, etc. But what did we do about our mind? Now, the mind's going to run the whole show all day long. Did we stop and check the fuel in the mine? Did we do anything to feed the mind that morning? Most of us don't. And what he's suggesting here is upon awakening. Now look at the words that he uses. He doesn't say 30 minutes after we get up. He doesn't say after the second cup of coffee. He says upon awakening, we think about the time ahead. And we have a little quiet time with God. Asking God to direct our thoughts. Asking God for the right thoughts and the right actions and the right etc. We feed the mind and then we take care of the material things. And usually life comes out a lot better. He tells us what to do in thinking about decision. About indecision. and thinking about our day, we may face indecision. Maybe we can't decide on some particular important matter for that particular day. We may not be able to determine which course to take. Here we ask God for inspiration and intuitive thought for a decision. We relax and take it easy. We don't struggle. We're often surprised how the right answers come after we've tried this for a while. You know, normally when I faced indecision, I'd run this thought into my mind, the problem in my mind, and up here in my mind, it's just a little bitty cheap computer. It's real bad, almost worn out anyhow. And I throw that, that thought in there and try to decide what to do. And it goes right on through and comes out the other side and says, don't have the answer for that. And I reach out and I grab it and I stick it back in there again. And it runs through and it comes out and it says, told you we don't have the answer to that. <laughs> And I grab it and stick it back in there again, and this time it just goes tilt. Absolute, complete frustration. Unable to decide what to do. What he's telling me to do here is turn it off. Ask God for the right thought or action. Ask God to help me make this decision, whatever it is. Recognizing that I don't know the answer. I've already run it through there two or three times, and there's no answer there. So I ask God for the right thought, the right decision, etc. And then he says, relax and take it easy. Now, I don't think he means lay down. I think what he really means when he says relax and take it easy is get our mind on something else. Get it off of that subject matter. God can't answer me as long as I've got my mind on it. How do I get it off of that subject matter? Well, very simple. I go out and start cutting the grass. I go out and start washing the car. I go out and start painting the house, doing something I've been putting off a long time anyhow. And it's absolutely amazing. An hour or two later, <clears throat> maybe that afternoon, my mind returns back to that thing I was thinking about and struggling with. And lo and behold, there's information there I didn't have before. Sometimes it's very simple. Sometimes it says, why don't you call Joe and see what Joe thinks? Now, I didn't think about that before. And I call old Joe, and by golly, Joe's got the answer just like that. And I used to say, my, my, wasn't it lucky I called Joe? Yeah. If you want to know, ask Joe. <laughs> Right. This is a this is a form of prayer and meditation for busy, busy, busy people. You see, we alcoholics we don't have time to, to lay down on the couch and listen to soft music. Uh, we don't have time to sit there and chant certain words over and over and over. We're busy people. And this is a form of meditation for busy people. At the top of page 87, let's see what he says about this meditation thing. So what used to be the hunch of occasional inspiration gradually becomes a working part of the mind. Being still inexperienced and having just made conscious contact with God, 
it's not probable that we're going to be inspired at all times. We might pay for this presumption in all sorts of observed actions and ideas. Nevertheless, we find that our thinking will, as time passes, be more and more on the plane of inspiration we come to rely upon it. You know, when I come to our cause and homage, I told you I had no spiritual knowledge whatsoever, no religious knowledge whatsoever. The knowledge I did have was that of a seven-year-old boy. I didn't know anything about prayer and meditation. Certainly didn't do any of it. But it gradually becomes a working part of my mind, you know. And I remember I hadn't been sober for a while, and one day I was somehow listening to the radio, and there was a song on there called In the Garden. You all know what that, that song, In the Garden? I was listening to it, and I've heard it a thousand times in my lifetime, it seemed like. Never did understand what it meant. A little light bulb went off in my head, and I said, well, that's a song about prayer and meditation, isn't it? Come to the garden alone in the morning while the dew's on the roses. That's what they're talking about. And it's prayer and meditation. And, and I kind of picked up on that. I got to reading in that other big, big book, and I could see things in there. And I, I said, well, this is what that means. I, you know, little, uh, little things went off in my head. What happens is that through prayer and meditation, you begin to teach yourself about things. Things begin to come to you. It you know, uh, becomes a working part of our minds that we come to rely upon it. And we just, we just teach ourselves about prayer and meditation. He said, what usually, we usually conclude the period of meditation with a prayer, talking, listening, that we should be shown all through the day where our next step is to be that we've been given whatever we need to take care of such problems. We asked especially for freedom from self-will, and we're careful to make no requests for ourselves only. We, we may ask for ourselves, however, if others will be helped. We are careful never to pray for our own selfish ends. Many of us have wasted a lot of time doing that. It doesn't work. You can easily say why. As I told you yesterday, the way I used to pray was God give me this and God give me that and God get me a new car and God help me make more money and for something I forgot to ask you for, please give me that also. <laughs> very, very, you can easily see why those kind of prayers don't work. They're very, very self selfish. I pray only, that's the big word, only for the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry that out. He said, if circumstances weren't, we ask our wives or friends to join us in morning meditation. About 15, 17 years ago, I'm sitting in my recliner reading my little prayer and meditation books. Phyllis is sitting in her recliner reading her prayer and meditation books. And she looked up a little bit and she said, Honey, you know how they are. I said, I wonder what this is going to cost. I got a good mind, you see. And she said, Well, would no. She said, Read this to me and tell me what it says. I said, Well, I can do that. So I read her little prayer and meditation and explained it to her. She, I told her a lot more than she wanted to know. <laughs> and the next morning she said, would you read this to me and tell me what this means? And I said, well, sure. And I read that to her and explained it to her. And she, we talked about it a little bit. And, well, that kind of began a little prayer and meditation session with us. And you girls will have to help us guys with this because we, we don't think that way. And uh, I've heard all my life those people that pray together stay together. How long has it been since you and Phyllis have had a divorce? We haven't. We got married uh, 25 years ago. And we haven't had a divorce since. Isn't Thank that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Phyllis is a great member of our cause, and I've been so for 26 years now. She's been a past delegate from our state, and she's very actively involved in service and AA, and she sponsors a lot of gals. And we have a wonderful life staying sober and doing this thing called our cause, and I'm it has put our lives back together, thank God. And I was thinking earlier today, my grandson, who's 23 years old right now, and he's over there in Saudi Arabia as we speak, to my knowledge, he's never had, a, he's never even had a beer, to my knowledge. He may have. My little, my little daughters, and little granddaughters, 17 and 14, to my knowledge, they've never had a drink or been in a bar, to my knowledge. If they have been, it hasn't caused anybody any problems. Their mom and dad have never mentioned it. And to me, that means that alcoholism has been, the chains of alcoholism has been broken in my family. It does not exist. They came to me and they said, Charlie, when you pray now, pray only for knowledge of his will and the power to carry that out. And I said, well, 
how in the hell is he going to know what I want if I don't tell him? Because you see, all my life I'd been taught that you pray for what you want. You tell God what you want. And they said, well, he's really not interested in what you want. They said he's interested in what you need. And they said he knows what you need much more than you do. They said you've been trying to get what you thought you needed all your life and you've almost destroyed yourself. Surely, surely, God knows more about it than you do. And I started praying only for knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out. Many years ago, if I had sat down and made a list of the things that I thought I needed, and if I'd turned to God and handed them to Him and said, now you give me this and I'll never ask for anything else, I would have cheated myself. Because God has given me so much more than I ever thought would be possible, period. Simply because of the fact that I'm trying to find out His will and trying to find the power to carry it out. And you know, God's always told a human race, you only got to do about two things to be happy anyhow. He always said, put no other, no other gods before me. And that could be money, power, prestige, sex, or anything else. And he said, do what you can for your fellow man. And I really think that's what God's will is for people like us. I don't know of any other reason why people like us are even alive. If it isn't, to try to help our fellow man, period. And I think as long as we do that, we're, we're going to get the things that we not only need, but probably most of the things that we want to, providing the things we want are good for us, too. My sponsor told me many, many years ago, Franklin, when I said, you mean i got to find God? And he said, Joe, God's not lost. He said, he said this, and the most important thing I'll probably say all weekend, seek God first, and then all things will be added to you. You seek God first, and everything you ever thought you ever dreamed of will come in the back door on you, and they'll just be there. That's what made my experience these last 29 years. Seek God first. When we straighten out spiritually, then the mental and the physical also becomes okay. This is AA's an inside job inside job we, we try to get right with the spirit first and then we get right with ourselves, and then right with a fellow man and then we can really start receiving God's will in our lives bottom of page 87 as we go through the day we pause when agitated or doubtful and ask for the right thought or action we constantly remind ourselves that we are no longer running the show Humbly saying to ourselves many times each day, Thy will be done. Now here's the results of this. We are then in much less danger of excitement, fear, anger, worry, self-pity, or foolish decisions. We become much more efficient. We do not tire so easily. For we're not burning up energy foolishly as we did when we were trying to arrange life to suit ourselves. Now here's the shortest paragraph in the big book. It works. It really does. That's a full paragraph within itself. We alcoholics are undisciplined. So we let God discipline us in the simple way we have just outlined. But this is not all. There is action and more action. Faith without works is dead. The next chapter is entirely devoted to step 12. Now, we're not going to try to go through the next chapter. It would just take simply too long. But let's talk just a little bit about step 12, and then we'll be through. Step 12, that's another one of the multiple-part steps. Three distinct parts in step 12. The first part, I think, is the greatest promise to be found anywhere in the big book. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I think that's what that's promising to me. Is I, if I will apply these first 11 steps in my life to the best of my ability, I'm guaranteed to have a spiritual awakening as the result. Now, what is a spiritual awakening? Well, a spiritual awakening is a personality change sufficient to recover from alcoholism. 
I am not what I used to be. I have been reborn. I am an entirely different human being than I was when I came to AA. My old ideas, emotions, and attitudes have been cast aside over a period of time and replaced with a new set of ideas, emotions, and attitudes. I don't think like I used to think. And since I don't think like I used to think, I don't act like I used to act either. And my life's a hell of a lot better than it used to be. Bill says in the 12 and 12, there's many kinds of spiritual awakenings there are people in AA. But they all have certain things in common. And that is that we're able to feel, believe, and do things we could never do before on our own strength unaided. I feel things I've never felt before. I feel love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill toward my fellow man. Before AA, I could have cared less about you. Oh, yeah, you could have some, but only after I extracted everything I wanted first. You always came second. I believe things I've never believed before. I believe God is a kind and a loving God. I believe He stands ready to help any human being anywhere in the world the instant they're ready to give up on self-will and turn back to God. I believe He's pure love. I believe He's pure mercy. Before I came here, I thought He was hellfire and brimstone. I don't believe that anymore. I can do things that I never could do before. By golly, I can stay sober. I never could do that before. And because of that sobriety, I'm allowed to do many, many, many things that I've always wanted to do but never could do because of my drunkenness. Now, we can sit here for the next three hours and just talk about the things that have taken place in our lives and the places we've gone and the things we've seen and the people we've met, and it's absolutely impossible. Uh, if, if, if we would write a story, <laughs> if we would write a story of the good things that's happened to us since we've been trying to do God's will, hell, nobody would print it because nobody would believe it. It's absolutely fantastic, the things that take place. So apparently we've had some kind of spiritual awakening. There's an old saying, though, that holds true. And that is, you don't get something for nothing. You have to pay for what you receive. And those of us who have had the spiritual awakening, we're charged with a responsibility now. And the responsibility is to carry this message. Not a message. Not the message. Not some message. This message to other alcoholics. And what is this message anyhow? Well, it's very simple. It goes something like this. If you're an alcoholic and you're still out there doing a little drinking once in a while, or if you're a member of AA and you're trying to get sober and you don't feel very good, we know just exactly where you're coming from because that's where we came from. We came to AA, and we picked up a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. And we applied the first 11 steps to the best of our ability in our lives. And we've had a spiritual awakening, and we're not that way anymore. And if you don't want to be that way anymore, then you do what we did. And you'll have a spiritual awakening also. And you won't be that way anymore. And while you're doing what we did, let us take you with a hand and we'll walk with you and help you do those things that we had to do in order to ensure that you can have your spiritual awakening. Now, that's the only message that AA's got. You know, some of us get to thinking we're healers. Some of us get to thinking we're marital advisors and economic advisors. I don't know of anybody that screwed that stuff up any worse than we did. No, we know one thing and one thing only. But let me tell you something. The thing that you and I know, 
Nobody. We are the experts in the field of alcoholism. You and I. We're the only people that's experienced it. We are the experts in recovery from alcoholism. We're the only people that's ever done it. And you and I have the knowledge to avert death in countless thousands and thousands of people if we are willing to carry this message the way the big book says to do it. Very few people get the privileges that we have and the opportunities to help other people the way we can. As I look back at AA and I look at our history, I'm absolutely convinced that God got tired of seeing people like us die back in the 1930s. I'm absolutely convinced that he picked out the original people. Dr. Jung, Roland Hazard, Hebe Thatcher, Dr. Silkworth, Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob, and the first 100. God's always worked with people through people. Very seldom does he speak to one of us direct. Well, I know one or two that tells me they've got his phone number, but I don't believe it. He works with people through people, I'm sure. But he picked those people out in the 1930s and put it together so alcoholics could quit dying from alcoholism. Now, all those people are gone. There's none of the first 100 left. They're all dead. But if he picked people then to do the job, then does it not stand the reasoning that he would be picking people today to do the job? There's not an alcoholic in this room that ought to be here. Every one of us ought to be dead. Some of us two, three, four, five times. And we used to say, my, wasn't we lucky last night? No, I don't think luck's got a thing to do with it. I think God picked you out. He let you suffer your alcoholism so you'll know what he wants you to know. And when he got ready to use you, then he removed the obsession to drink. Now, the only question is, is what are we going to do with it? You know, we're the lucky ones. We're the miracles. They tell me today that 97 out of 100 alcoholics are going to die not even knowing they're alcoholic. Now, if that's true, then it means about 3% of them stumbling into AA. And only about 5 or 10% of those coming into AA are recovering from alcoholism. We're talking about less than 1 out of 100. Now, you and I have the knowledge and the skills to raise that number if we will do what we're supposed to do. One thing that AA lacks today, everywhere I go, the greatest shortage I see is good sponsors. The greatest shortage I see in AA today is good sponsors. Good sponsors not only go out on 12-step calls, not only go by and pick people up and take them to meetings, but good sponsors tell them the truth. Good sponsors take them to the big book. Good sponsors lead them through the Big Book Alcoholics Anonymous, which is our program of recovery. And the book told us in the very beginning what our problem is. We owe that information to every alcoholic that comes within, within our touch and within our reach. They don't know what's wrong with them. The Big Book gave us a solution to our problem. We owe that to every alcoholic that walks in the door of AA to be sure they understand the solution. The big book gave us a program of action on how to find that solution. We owe that program of action to every alcoholic that comes in AA. That's our job, and that's our responsibility. And as long as we do that, AA is going to be here. But I'll guarantee you, if we continue to water our program down, 
if we continue to try to be all things to everybody, then sooner or later we'll lose it. Just like the Washingtonians lost it, and just like everybody else lost it. We do have the responsibility for AA. The final thing that I have to do in step 12 is and try to practice these principles in all our affairs or all my affairs. And what are these principles? I hear arguments go on about this all the time. Some people say, well, the principle of one is this, and the principle of two is that, and the principle of three is that. No, I don't think that's true. Bill had already used the word steps once in step 12 when he said having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. He didn't want to use it again. So rather than saying tried to practice these steps in all our affairs, he said tried to practice these principles in all our affairs. The 12 steps are the principles. In the forward of the 12 and 12, he says the 12 steps are a set of principles, spiritual in nature. So I think step 12, the last part of it, is telling me to try to practice these 12 steps in all my affairs. It's easy for me to practice them here in AA. I love you and I hope you love me. And we're going to do our best not to hurt each other. But what do I do outside of AA? I'm only in AA at the most an hour, two hours a day. What do I do the other 22, 23 hours a day? Do I practice these steps in my home with my spouse? Can I realize how powerless I really am over that lady? Can I see the insanity of trying to control her knowing full well that I can't? Can I make a decision to turn her will and her life over to care of God as I understand it? <laughs> Can I inventory me and find those defects of character that keep me trying to control? Can I discuss that with somebody else? Can I ask God to take those away from me? Can I make amends to her quickly when I've harmed her? There's times I'm ashamed of me. There's times I treat absolute strangers on the street with more courtesy than I treat my own wife in my own home. Just think, if I could practice these steps there with her and she with me, why, we might pick up 10, 12, 14 hours a day where we could be peaceful and happy and free. If we don't, we don't stand a chance. We're at each other's throat continually. How about with my children? Can I practice them there? Can I realize how powerless I am over them? Can I realize the insanity of trying to control them? If I could practice these principles with my children, then what little time we have left together would be good times. Otherwise, I try to control. They resist. We have no good times at all. How about on the job? Can I practice these 12 steps on the job with my fellow employees? You know, if I could really practice them there, well, I might be peaceful and happy and free on the job, too. Aren't we really saying that you and I have the tools to be peaceful and happy and free 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, if we wish to? But make no mistake now, God's not going to do this for you. Other people aren't going to do this for you. But will you, with God's help and the help of other people, can do it for yourself? I really do believe that we are the luckiest people in the world. I don't know of anybody else that has the opportunity to live the kind of lives that we can live in the future. If we're willing to follow a simple set of steps called the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Joe, let's go to page 164. Yeah, you know, most of this stuff comes from medicine, psychology, and religion. And I was reading in that other big book one day, and this guy who was practicing these principles and carrying this message said to us one night at a meeting, he said, the things that I do, you can do also, and even greater. 
And a couple of guys heard this, and they went back home and got their sick friend and brought him to the meeting the next night. And I like to think those two were alcoholics. Because they got to the meeting the next night, and the thing was standing room only. Couldn't get anybody else in. And the reason I think they were alcoholics is because they went up on the roof and chopped a hole in the roof. And they let that guy down in there. And this guy looked down at him, and he looked up at him, and he said, well, it's by your faith that this man is healed. See, it was by the faith of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous when I came in. It was by their faith in this program that I was able to stick around for a while so that I, too, could come to believe, that I, too, could come to have faith. It was through their faith. And on this same guy was a little town called Cernan a little bit later, and he was uh, carrying the message or talking that night. And after the meeting was over with us, standing around drinking a little coffee and smoking a few cigarettes and talking, and one of the guys said to him, said, you know, we have a guy locked up on the cave on the side of the hill. He's very selfish and self-centered and frightened and inconsiderate, and he harms an awful lot of people. And this guy said, I want to go up there and talk to him. He said, oh, man, don't, you don't want to go talk to him. We've got him chained to the wall. He's dangerous. He said, no, I want to go talk to him. So tell me what his name is. He said his name is Legions, for he is many. Many defective characters, you see. So he went up there and talked to old Legions for a little while and cut loose the chains of resentment and anger, selfish and self-centered, and set him free, just like he did us. And then uh, he wrote a little step right here for us all the other guys he took with him. And Legion asked him a question. He said, can I go with you and do what you do? And he said, no. Legion, what I want you to do is just stay here and tell people what happened to you. That's all. Bill calls it, pass it on. Page 164, it says, our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. The last two paragraphs. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who's still sick. The answers will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right. And great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is a great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. We did that in steps one, two, and three. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. We did that in 4, 5, 6, and 7. Clear away the records of your past. We did that in 8 and 9. Give freely of what you find and join us. We'll do that in 10, 11, and 12. And we shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May, May God, God bless, bless you and keep you until then. Thank, Thank you, you all for much. letting us be here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.